name is Robert Chen, and I'm going to be talking about uh, AWS SAM and how you can use it to build your serverless app with API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB. Um, but before I dive uh, into SAM, I wanted to first give a little bit of background on um, why you would want to build your app with serverless in the first place, and second, uh, why you would even need something like a serverless framework. So um, if we take a step back, uh, you might be used to a more traditional server architecture where you have uh, a web server in your public DMZ, um, and then that's going to talk to an application server, maybe that's running Java with some API endpoints, and then uh, all of your data is in this database layer. Now, uh, serverless architecture is going to look a little bit different. So uh, if you could see this, uh, it's going to have an S3 website. Then that's going to uh, talk to API Gateway and Lambda. And then on the back end, it's going to have something like DynamoDB. So one thing you'll notice is that uh, everything in this serverless row are uh, they're managed services instead of individual servers. So you don't have to maintain individual servers. You don't have to patch, carry an on-call pager, rotate passwords, and all that. Uh, Amazon will manage all of their managed services for you. Um, Pre-provisioning versus elasticity. So say if you have a marketing push uh, and you spin up an elastic load balancer with two servers underneath, and then you cross your fingers hoping that uh, that uh, the traffic is not going to knock down your stack. Um, you don't have to worry about any of that because these are managed services and they're designed to handle uh, traffic at a web scale. And uh, probably the most important reason for using serverless is cost. Uh, with uh, traditional servers, you have to pay for idle uptime even if no one's using it. But with uh, managed services, uh, they have utility pricing. So you pay uh, per request uh, or per Lambda cycle. So um, this is an example of how much uh, savings you could get from converting from uh, an EC2 application to uh, serverless Lambda. Uh, th this graphic is from a, a recent article I found on Twitter but um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are starting to realize this. So um, when possible, it's uh, usually best to uh, create an application with a serverless architecture. Uh, now, uh, if you start doing things with serverless, uh, you're going to want to start looking into serverless frameworks. Uh, and, and this is the reason why. So say if you create like a hello world application and you've got you know, your hello world lambda with a little API gateway in front of it. Uh, you show it around to your coworkers and your, your manager says, hey, that's cool. Uh, why don't we add a couple more features? So now uh, you add a couple more lambdas and the application becomes a little bit more complicated. And then you go to production. So now you have a, a whole a lot of lambdas, and you're clicking around uh, the AWS console, hoping that you get all of the settings correct. Um, but over time, as you're managing uh, and juggling all these different lambdas, uh, over time, your configuration is going to drift. And that's where the serverless framework comes in. Uh, serverless framework is pretty popular. Uh, a lot of people are using it. We've definitely used it here for the past year. Um, it's great. Uh, what the serverless framework does is two things. One, it helps you deploy uh, not just your Lambda code, but your entire scripted infrastructure to AWS. And two, uh, it helps you manage uh, complexity. So um, it could be pretty complicated with CloudFormation with the roles and like all the different pieces and wiring them together. The, the serverless framework uh, does a really good job in uh, compacting your configuration and simplifying everything. Um, this is an article that I wrote on our, our blog. It's a tutorial for writing your first serverless um, 
application, I guess. Uh, if, if you're interested in learning about serverless, you could check the docs and you could go through this tutorial as well. So if you, if you go through a serverless tutorial, uh, they'll give you like a little uh, starter template and it basically comes with a single Lambda and an API gateway endpoint. And in 12 lines of code, um, you basically have those two pieces of AWS infrastructure. But what serverless is doing under the hood is that they're creating all of this. So it's pretty complicated. It's got IAM roles, serverless deployment buckets, um, probably stage deployments, who knows. Uh, so uh, managing complexity is definitely something that you wanna use uh, with a serverless framework. Okay, so uh, now we know why you would wanna uh, build an application with serverless and why you would wanna use a serverless framework. So the next question is, what is SAM? SAM is a squirrel. Uh, SAM stands for serverless application model. Uh, they basically give you two commands and three new cloud formation resource types. Uh, it doesn't seem like much at first, but uh, it actually gives you all the tools you need to do almost everything that the serverless framework uh, can do as well. So uh, before I said that the serverless framework takes care of deployment and managing complexity. And so these are your deployment commands and uh, these three resources uh, help you manage complexity. So uh, I'm gonna go through a demo over the next three hours and there's a URL here that points to my repo on GitHub. Um, actually, before I, before I jump to the repo, um, I'll just go through uh, a brief overview of what we're gonna walk through. So first step, we create a Lambda, and then we, we park the code in a deployment bucket on S3. Then we stick an API gateway endpoint in front of it. Then we drop in a, a DynamoDB table then we wire the DynamoDB table. Then we put everything into a stage or an environment or tier or whatever you want to call it. So you could deploy it to dev, QA, production uh, in a scripted fashion. Um, then if there's time, I'm gonna go over a couple of hurdles that you might run into. Um, these, these could be pretty frustrating uh, when, when you hit them for the first time, um, but the solutions are actually pretty simple or they're either simple or I'm not doing it correctly. Uh, and then at the very end, um, I'm gonna slap on uh, a website on S3 uh, as the consumer. Okay, so uh, if you could see that uh, this is a Bitbucket, not a Bitbucket, a GitHub repo uh, that I created the other day. Uh, I don't know if this is the right way to use GitHub, but Basically, I have um, like 12 tags. Uh, they, they tag specific commits. And what you do is you start at tag zero, and then uh, you read the steps in the readme. And then after you're done, uh, you move on to uh, the next tag and so forth. And so each tag will have its own readme with instructions. So um, uh, this is tag zero. This is sort of like a set up your environment. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. So in order for you to do anything, uh, you need to have the AWS CLI installed on your machine. So uh, you wanna run AWS configure, and then you wanna plug in your uh, developer access keys, and those keys are gonna determine which account you deploy uh, your Lambda to, and it's also gonna give you authorization to deploy your code. Uh, well, how do I get uh, AWS CLI? You install it uh, using pip, the Python package manager. And if you don't have Python, then you install Python using Homebrew. And if you don't have Homebrew, then you can install it with this Ruby command. Um, I'm not gonna walk through the setup because um, I'm already set up and I don't wanna mess up my setup. Uh, so, so step one. Uh, step one, let's see, what's the best way to do this? So I have here like my source tree. So 
uh, I'm going to check out uh, step one. And then just for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to, I'm going to just deploy it. And then uh, it takes a while to deploy. So in the meantime, I could explain uh, what's going on. So So in step one, there's basically uh, three files that you have to deal with. And step one is actually probably the most complicated step because you're doing like three things at the same time. Um, but everything after this gets a lot easier. So uh, the first file is a Python file. Uh, what it does is it creates a canned response and then it just returns the response. Uh, the second file is your uh, SAM template. And uh, I'll get into that in a moment. And the third file is this bash script, which you use for deployments. And I know what you're thinking, oh, bash. Like, why are you using bash? Well, I'm using bash. <laughs> so this is your SAM template. And if you've used serverless framework before, um, it looks like the serverless YAML, but it's not. It's actually CloudFormation. So uh, the only difference between this and CloudFormation is this line two transform. It's using what's called like a serverless transform, which takes really basic syntax and blows it up to whatever you actually need. Uh, so th this SAM template uh, basically has one thing. It's, it's got your Lambda, hello Lambda, and it's, called, it's of type AWS serverless function. And it's got all the properties that you would expect in a Lambda I'm using the Python runtime. Um, this is uh, how much memory I'm using. Um, it's got this neat property called policies. So you could staple on uh, pre-baked policies. This is the Lambda execution, which gives you anything a Lambda would need for the first time, which is writing to CloudWatch, I think. Um, the interesting bit for this is the code URI. So it's pointing to a folder I called source. And then in the source folder, it's got my Python, uh, Python file. And then the handler here, um, if you're used to serverless framework, is index.lambda handler. And if you remember our Python file, it's called index. And the method of entry is lambda handler. So it's just, it's just glue configuration. Uh, the interesting part of this step one is uh, the bash script that I wrote. Um, so I'll start from the bottom. Uh, this second half here uh, has two commands, AWS CloudFormation package and deploy. And this syntax has a lot of command line arguments, but um, it, you just copy and paste it from the AWS documentation. Uh, this here is stuff that I put in. Um, here I'm creating the bucket if it doesn't exist. Here I clean up the build directory and clean out artifacts just in case, because I'm paranoid. And these are just variables so that um, uh, all of, it, so, so that it's a single point of change uh, all bubbled up to the top. So if I need to make any changes, I'll just make it here and then it'll, it'll get applied throughout. So uh, it looks like it's done deploying. And then if I go over to my Um, AWS account. Uh, here's the SAM tutorial CloudFormation stack. Uh, if I go to Lambda, because we're deploying a Lambda, uh, we have this one Lambda here called Hello Lambda. Uh, it's got our code with our response. And then if you click test, uh, you can test it right from the AWS console, and then it'll reply with uh, hello, hello whatever. So, so that's, that's step one. Um, let me switch over to step two. Uh, deploy it real quick. Um, show you the slide. Uh, so in step two, we just slap a API gateway interface uh, in front of the Lambda. And the code is actually pretty, Simple. Uh, 
this is all we're adding. So uh, we're still within the Lambda, and there's an events property. Lambda can receive different types of events. You could receive an S3 event when someone creates an S3 file. Uh, there are CloudWatch events, so you could do a cron job in the cloud using CloudWatch. Uh, here, um, it's an API gateway uh, REST event with the path of slash test and a method of get. Now, um, AWS SAM is smart enough to know that, hey, it looks like you're listening for an API gateway event, but I don't see any API gateway resources here. So uh, it will automatically auto magically uh, take the information you have here and infer and create uh, an API gateway endpoint for you. Um, so I think it's done deploying. And then uh, within the AWS console, I should be able to go into API gateway, uh, find the endpoint, um, and then test it. And then here I have my status code of 200 and my response body, hello, uh, from Sam Tutorial. Okay, uh, step three. Um, I'm gonna deploy it real quick. Jump over to uh, the keynote. So in step three, we just drop a table and that's it. Uh, the only difference in the code is this right here. Uh, we added another resource. So um, before, the only resource we had was uh, the Lambda, and now we're adding a second resource, uh, which is AWS serverless simple table. So simple table is kind of like um, the Fisher Price of DynamoDB. It, it's DynamoDB under the hood, but they only give you like a primary key and that's it. So here it says, like say if I have an Excel spreadsheet, a single column called name, and each of those items is a string. And then I'm cheap, so all of the provision capacity is all the way down to one. And then, uh, oh wow, it's still deploying. Okay, so if I go into the AWS console, go over to DynamoDB, uh, and then I click on tables, uh, this, is my, um, this is my table that I generated. So the table name is Sam Tutorial Hello Table and then some random string. If you go into items, there aren't any items, so I could create an item, Rob, I guess, and then let's create another one. Sam, and, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so the table's pretty useless uh, by itself. So the next step is to wire the table. And uh, ac actually, I need to check out the diff to see what, I'm, what I actually did. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of changes that I made uh, in a couple of different places. Uh, this is still our Lambda up here and our table down here. So the first change is in the Lambda. Um, the Lambda has to be able to communicate with the DynamoDB table. So I added a policy DynamoDB full access. So, I mean, it's okay for a demo, but if this is a real application, you might wanna uh, tailor down access a little bit. Uh, the second thing that I added uh, was this environment variable, uh, still within the Lambda. Now, um, environment variables in Lambda is so somewhat recent. So the reason why I did this was uh, simple table uh, does not support the ability to name your table. Uh, because they really simplify it. So you have to grab the table name somehow dynamically. And you do that by using the CloudFormation uh, reference function. 
and then you could get the table, which is like Sam tutorial table, and then some random whatever. And then you feed that into an environment variable that I call my table name. And then uh, since this is in the Lambda environment variable, uh, it will be accessible to my uh, code. And then if you look at the code, I made a couple changes. Uh, Boto3, um, it's basically the AWS SDK for Python. Uh, what I do is uh, import the SDK and then get the DynamoDB APIs. Then I grab the process environment, or in Python, the OS environment uh, variable that I called my table name. So I have a table name here. And then I do dynamodb.table and then this table name. And so now I have a handle to the table. And then I run a scan, which is just give me everything. And then I take the scan results and I JSON dump it into the response. So I don't remember if I deployed this, but I'll give it a try. Okay, so uh, in API Gateway, uh, same tutorial uh, test. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, so uh, in the response body, I get like a JSON response, including including the two names that I hard coded into the table. Uh, all right, so. Is everyone okay so far? Okay, um, next change. Next change, I'm gonna add a stage. So everything is gonna get wrapped into a dev environment, and then I could change it from dev to QA to production, and I get spin down entire stages or environments all together. I'm not using it. And let's see. Okay, in order to um, implement a stage, so if you've used the serverless framework, uh, they have stage deployments built in. You, you go serverless, uh, deploy, and then it'll automatically deploy it to a dev stage. Or you could do uh, SLS deploy dash S, prod and then it'll create a production uh, environment or stage for you. Um, AWS SAM doesn't uh, give you that out of the box. Uh, serverless framework is a little bit more developer friendly. But uh, according to the docs, AWS says there's plenty of ways for you to implement uh, stage deployment uh, using existing tools. So that's what uh, I do here. So we're back to the bash script. Um, I declare a variable called stage, and it's gonna take the first argument, so I could do deploy.sh prod, and then it'll take the first argument and then assign it to the stage variable. Now, if I have no arguments, then it will default to uh, dev, and this stage name will be added to the project name, so it's now the SAM tutorial dev stack. Uh, since the project name is being fed into the bucket, the bucket name is now gonna be unique as well. And then um, the dev suffix is gonna be plugged in uh, all throughout. There's also one more thing on the uh, CloudFormation deploy command. Um, this supports uh, a flag parameter overrides. So you know how if you've ever worked with CloudFormation, uh, usually you create a CloudFormation template, and if you want to uh, insert in, say, like a database password, then you would have uh, CloudFormation parameters. Uh, and then when you click through and create your CloudFormation template, then you could, uh, at runtime, type in that password so it's not committed into your code. So uh, since we're deploying everything via command line, you never have that chance to uh, interact with the GUI. So here it lets you uh, pass in those parameters uh, via command line. And now in the SAM template, or the CloudFormation template, uh, we have our parameters up here. Um, I'm looking for a parameter called environment 
of type string. And then the only place I really use it is in the function name, so I don't conflict with the existing stack. Um, this exclamation sub is like a string interpolation method baked into uh, CloudFormation. So it'll read hello lambda hyphen def. Uh, so if I go to the AWS console, um, this is the first CloudFormation stack um, that we did earlier. And this is the one I just did uh, passing in dev. And then if you click on the resources here, you'll also notice that um, the Lambda function also has um, the dev suffix in its name as well. Uh, oh, one thing I want to show you real quick. Um, so here's a API Gateway, and here's the dev URL. Um, in order to get the actual URL, you go down to um, Wow, I think they just moved it. <laughs> oh, um, here, dashboard, dashboard. No? Here, dashboard. Okay, here we go. Um, so if you go into dashboard, uh, you have access to the full URL, which is up here. And then you could copy it and then paste it into your favorite browser. Um, our endpoint was called slash test. And so instead of going into API Gateway and then clicking that test button, um, you can get access to the URL through dashboard. And one thing that kind of annoys me is that uh, I'm deploying to the dev uh, environment, but it says prod here. So it'd be nice to fix that before we move on. So, um, let me deploy this real quick. OK, so I just deployed um, the next step uh, within Git. And uh, in order to change uh, that one piece in the URL from prod to dev, you have to add all this. So, um, so before we were working with uh, Lambda, which is AWS serverless function, DynamoDB, which is AWS serverless simple table, and now we're working with the third piece that Sam gives you, which is AWS serverless API. And before we were taking this shortcut where we just added an event and then we relied on SAM to do all the heavy lifting for us. But um, the proper way to do it is to declare your own AWS serverless API and then, and then do all this. So it looks like a lot is going on, but really uh, it just has two things. One is the stage name, which is dev, which is exactly what we want. Uh, the second thing is the definition body. And the definition body takes a Swagger document. And I don't know if you're familiar with Swagger, but Swagger is just uh, a standard way to define your API endpoints, like uh, slash test, and then the verb is going to be get. Um, and then uh, API Gateway also has other properties that allow you to um, integrate it with a Lambda right here, and then uh, manipulate the response. I personally don't know that much about Swagger, but um, uh, that's kind of what it looks like. And it, it might be a little um, intimidating to, uh, to write all the Swagger syntax by hand, but the thing is you don't have to. Uh, if you go into API Gateway, uh, go to Stages, 
and then the tier. Um, and you go to export. You could go down here to export as Swagger plus API. And then under YAML, they, they, give you, they give you the Swagger. So you could go into API Gateway, click around, make changes, and then just copy and paste uh, the Swagger document. OK, so um, we, we, we added this big chunk of code. And the only other difference that, um, that I made was down here, um, within the Lambda, I have to reference um, the API gateway. So uh, let's see. Hopefully, this is going to work. Um, if I go to dashboard, uh, copy this. So I get a response. Um, so if I type in dev, which is uh, the stage name that I provided, then, then it still gives me a response. So um, I guess in their, the way they do it is they give you a stage called stage, and then they also give you another stage called whatever stage name you specify, which is dev. Um, OK, so, uh, so, so to recap, Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, uh, and then a stage. Now I'm going to um, explore some of the practical uses and hurdles that you might run into in real life. Uh, binary media types, um, if, you, if you ever make a post to API Gateway, Everything is going to be in what, like application JSON, like UTF-8. Um, so that means you cannot upload any binary. So image slash PNG, application octet stream, or whatever, uh, gzip, all that stuff, you can't upload. Unless you go into API Gateway, uh, click on binary support, and then you edit, and then you do Im image slash PNG or something like that. Now, um, for months, I've been going into each Lambda and typing in like application oct octet stream, whatever, like post deployment. So I'm scripted up to a certain point, And then I have like three additional steps that serverless framework or whatever framework I, I was using was unable to handle. And it's kind of a pain when you have like four different stages and two different regions and all that. So it's actually really easy to do with AWS SAM, it turns out. Um, so if I check this out and then deploy it, and then we take a look at the code. Um, these are the only two lines that I added, and it will give you binary support. And the thing is, if you're using a Swagger definition, you could just add these two lines, and then it just works. And well, hopefully it'll work. <laughs> just looking at all your expressions, it seems like you've you've all actually done this before. <laughs> you've all figured this out. So thanks a lot for letting me know. <laughs> OK, so if I refresh the page, uh, it should have star slash star. OK, uh, next thing is um, next thing is cores. So um, if, if you deploy your Lambda API gateway, um, you're going to have some sort of API gateway generated URL. Uh, and then if you have a website, that's going to be on some domain, like thorntech.com. But the domain names, they don't match uh, because, of course, you're not allowed to call it a different domain name uh, via JavaScript. So you need to support cores in your API. And there's, there's different ways to do it. 
like honestly, I don't fully understand it all myself. Um, but for example, you could go into here, um, resources, get actions, and then uh, enable cores, and then you enable it, and then it makes a whole bunch of changes, and it's one of the other things that you need to add uh, in, in the AWS console GUI steps post configuration. And, and it still doesn't work <laughs> because I don't know why. Uh, maybe because API Gateway is actually fronted by a CloudFront distribution and it's not getting forwarded along. Well, anyway, so I, I came across, um, I, I came across a little workaround. It, it works for me. I don't know if this is the right way to do it. Maybe you could tell me. So, uh, but before we can um, test that workaround, we actually have to create a website. So I'm gonna switch to the next event. And instead, instead of Instead of re relying on the commit, I'm actually gonna do a couple of things by hand. So uh, something could go wrong. Okay, so I've been neglecting my GitHub page, but now I'm on tag eight already. Uh, I'm gonna create a React JS website. I'm not a React developer, I have coworkers who are. So uh, I'm gonna run first, npm install globally create react, react app, which is your, it creates like a little boiler plate uh, React um, website for you. Well, I already had it installed, so that was pretty quick. Uh, now that you've installed uh, this npm module, you could run create react app and then whatever website you wanna call it, I'm gonna call it test website. Okay, and then within the website folder, I'm gonna do yarn start. And then that's gonna start up a website on my local machine. And then uh, you could update it live um, by editing the app.js. So if I do something like, uh, add some text, then it should add it, add it live. So, um, ooh, WebStorm, it's struggling. Okay, so now we have a website. I'm gonna get back to my git commits. So I'm gonna check out this next commit. Okay, so 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 this is what the React code looks like. I'm not a React developer, so I'm just sort of fumbling around here. But there's a render function, uh, which is sort of like the entry point to your website. Um, component did mount is sort of like a lifecycle event that happens earlier on, uh, basically when your uh, web page loads. And here, there's a built-in uh, fetch API caller uh, built into React, which I fetch my uh, endpoint, and then I console out the response. Now, this endpoint is the endpoint that I had when I created this a couple days ago, so I actually have to uh, update this to, what was this, KZZ, let's try this. So if I open up the console, uh, what it's gonna do is it's gonna try to make the API call, but it's, it's gonna fail because of cores, because I don't have cores enabled. So in order um, to enable cores, 
Um, what I'm going to do is switch over to this commit, uh, getting past cores. And then and then deploy it. And the only change I made, um, like there's different solutions out there. Uh, I was like researching this for a while. Uh, there's solutions where you can add like paragraphs and paragraphs of, uh, of Swagger uh, CloudFormation syntax to add various um, options uh, within API Gateway to support cores, headers, and then and all that. Um, I just ended up adding a single header in the Lambda saying access control allow origin star. Uh, it seems to work for my purposes, um, but if this is like a real application, you might want to um, put a little bit more research into it. Okay, so um, the Lambda should be deployed with giving back the course header. And then if I reload this, um, it'll get back, it'll get back the data. So, um, the last step, last step is going to be to deploy, um, the React website to S3. But I noticed that I skipped something. So, uh, if I go back to uh, this package and deploy, um, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around at this point, but uh, when I deploy my uh, SAM template to AWS, I'm using uh, two commands, package and deploy. And it's, it's doing a lot of stuff here, um, and it took a while for me to figure out quite what it's trying to do. Um, but I have a couple of slide animations uh, to help uh, grasp the concept. So here we have our SAM template and then our code within that source folder. Um, what package does is it first asks, okay, uh, SAM template, where's the code? And then the template says, oh, it's in the source folder. And then it'll take the code, zip it, zip it up, and then upload it to S3. Then the package command uh, makes a copy of the template uh, called output.yaml or whatever. Uh, but instead of this template knowing where the code is on your local machine, you have a copy of the template that knows where the code is in S3, because uh, this is a, a dynamic location. So that's the package half. The other half is deploy. And what deploy does, it just uploads th the generated YAML into CloudFormation. So, so that's package and deploy. Um, all right, so the final step uh, we want to do is deploy our website up to S3, uh, because that's sort of the whole point of having the website. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna check this out. Um, I'm gonna make a quick change to the template. And then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna deploy it and hope it works. Okay, so um, when you deploy your uh, React website to S3, uh, there's a couple things that you need to do. Um, aside from all the SAM stuff, uh, you're gonna add two more resources uh, one is your S3 bucket, 
um, it's just your CloudFormation AWS S3 bucket. Um, you're going to make it publicly ac accessible, and you're going to enable it for um, enable it as a website. Now, um, just because you say that it's public read doesn't mean that people can actually access the resources inside the bucket. I don't think uh, you actually have to create a policy that will apply recursively to all of the objects inside. So you create a bucket policy uh, that will apply to uh, this resource, and then uh, it's going to allow get object to everyone. Uh, I also added a couple of convenience uh, CloudFormation things at the end. So uh, just, just like we had parameters at the top where you could feed things in, uh, you could also output information with CloudFormation. So one is going to be uh, the website URL, which is, uh, since our S3 bucket is a website, I want to get the URL to that without having to poke around through the console. Also, that API gateway URL, which I've been clicking around and getting from the dashboard every time, uh, I just pasted in code that will just grab it. So I think it's done deploying. Uh, if I go into CloudFormation, and then outputs, I have the website URL and the API gateway endpoint. So if I go to the website, well, I get an error because I didn't upload anything yet. Uh, and then the API gateway URL, I'm just gonna copy this and then use it for um, the next thing that I need. Uh, one moment. I think this endpoint is up to date. Yeah, it's up to date. Okay, that's good. Um, so how do you upload your React website to S3? Well, um, all you need are these two commands. So uh, we're in the package JSON. So whenever you do like npm, uh, M npm run deploy, uh, you could run a pre-deploy, which will build it, which takes your website, it builds it into something that's deployable. And then the deploy command is going to um, run AWS S3 upload to um, this S3 bucket. So the other thing that I need to ch uh, change here is the S3 bucket ID. Uh, so let me grab that real quick. Okay, so um, at this point, I should be able to go into the website and then, what was it, npm run deploy. And this will uh, hopefully build it first and then run the deploy, which is to uh, upload it to S3. And then if I take this S3 URL, uh, I should have the React website. And then, oops. And then within the console, uh, it'll console out the data. And uh, there, there's one more step, <laughs> sorry. Um, the last step is just to render the, the stuff in the web page, but, well, all right, I'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> Hang on.
So, so there's a bunch of things that I had to change over again uh, because I switched the commit and uh, discarded all of my changes. So hopefully this works. And, and it, it does not. Well, anyway, um, if you have time, you can, <laughs> you can take a look at it. Um, well, that's pretty much it <laughs> for my talk. <laughs> oh, way to end strong. Um, but it, if you want to go through this um, at your own pace, you could visit uh, the GitHub repo and then step through the tags yourself. Uh, we're gonna re we have this recorded, and then we're going to upload it so you can follow along um, if if you ever uh, end up working on a SAM project. And uh, that's pretty much it.